Hey everyone, welcome back to the Roast West Coast Coffee Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Wolt, and we are here for another Coffee Smarter session with our resident coffee expert, Chris O'Brien. He is the proprietor of Coffee Cycle in Pacific Beach and the guy who turned all of his Dave Matthews Band concert t-shirts into a quilt. Chris does not like cold brew coffee, so of course I decided to ask him about it. And he gets into it. He dives into the science, really dives into the science, and why he feels the way he does about cold brew. Full disclosure, they don't serve a true cold brew at Coffee Cycle. Chris and his team make flash chilled or Japanese style iced coffees, which are essentially made to order brewed pour overs, quickly dropped into a glass filled with ice. Be sure to check out roastwestcoast.com for more information about flash chilled coffee in this episode's recap. You will also find all of the links referenced on this show, updates from our guests and coffee industry partners, coffee news, and much more. Check it out. That's roastwestcoast.com. Now, let's see if Chris can help us get a little coffee smarter today. Mr. O'Brien, thank you for coming back after uh, we left things last Last time when we were talking about cat poop, I felt uh, there was a little tension, but it feels like maybe that is, you know, enough time has passed that we've simmered down. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not where I was going with this, but uh, I think we can sincerely say that we're glad to be here again today to get coffee smarter. Absolutely. And so I wanted to to thank you for being, you know, the OG coffee smarter expert on the Roast West Coast podcast. And now you should say something nice about me. Well, I think you are incredible for gathering this group of excellent coffee people together. I think you've come up with some awesome questions this season. I think you actually might even learn a little something from at least one of these episodes. Chris, I appreciate that compliment. And uh, for today's question, I wanted to ask you about cold brew. How is cold brew different from a regular cup of coffee? I mean, cold brew is everywhere. Obviously, over the past few years, it's exploded in popularity. A ton of our local roasters are making some variation of cold brew available in either a can or by the growler or on draft. Is it as simple as just brewing a regular pot of coffee and throwing it in the fridge for a while? And if not, then, you know, how do we make it? And then what are some of the characteristics of, say, a good cold brew? You know, this is this is kind of a funny question for me, and I, I didn't I didn't warn you when you sent me the preliminary list of questions that this is sort of funny for me. But um, since you worked with me for a little bit, uh, you may remember that. I don't, I don't know exactly what you remember. Like you've probably repressed a lot of those memories of working with me. But I'm not the biggest cold brew fan most of the time, and that's kind of funny to me when I look back at my history of coffee. Because cold brew, toddy, as we used to call it most of the time, was actually one of the ways that I really got into coffee. And at the first roastery I ever worked at back in Cleveland, Ohio, Phoenix Coffee Roasters, I remember I took coffee home with me and I made cold brew out of their Tanzania pea berry, because we always made cold brew out of their, their Mexico Chiapas. And I made a Tanzania pea berry and then I made a Sumatra cold brew. And I remember both of those being really unique and different. And I just thought it was so cool that I could take these different coffees and get this different taste out of it with this different brewing method. And at the time, I was really sold also on, you know, the talking points that people will talk about cold brew, they'll say how it's lower acidity and gentle on your stomach. Sometimes they'll say it's higher caffeine. Preface this probably overly long winded answer to your question which is, you know, the, the guts of our interview, is that basically there's a lot of misinformation about cold brew out there. Cold brew is exactly what it sounds like it is. It is, is cold coffee, but rather than just being cold coffee, it's coffee that's brewed with cold water. And not necessarily cold like refrigerated water or ice water, but just cold as in not hot. So the Specialty Coffee Association specifies that 194 to 204, 208, a minimum of 194 degrees Fahrenheit is needed to brew a good cup of coffee hot. But then cold brew. So why can we get 
good coffee with water that's less than 194 degrees. If 194 degrees is required, why cold brew? Can I guess? Sure. I'm going to guess it's the other side of that equation, and it's time. And that is basically how cold brew works at all, is that when we brew a hot coffee, so excellent, excellent job, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> I'm fist pumping. That's two compliments today. I'm fist pumping in my little podcast booth right now because I'm so excited <laughs> that I got that right. <laughs> so yeah, with a regular hot coffee, you're brewing it anywhere from you know three minutes up to maybe six or eight minutes on a big batch of gallon and a half coffee. But it's, it's you know three to eight minutes is a pretty short gap of time. Cold brew, you're brewing anywhere from twelve to forty eight hours. Usually, people say. 24 hours, but it really can be anywhere from 12 to 48 hours. Hmm. That's a lot longer than I would have guessed. Well, have you ever made sun tea? You know, where you just take tea leaves or tea bags and you put them in a mason jar full of cold water and you stick it out in the sun for a day? You know, the concept is pretty much the same. You're just letting it happen over a longer period of time with minimum agitation and sort of letting it happen, you know, we would say naturally or, you know, organically. To me, that feels more like a science experiment than something I would drink. Yeah, and I think early on, cold brews, it was very much a science experiment. And I think that a lot of the misinformation and poor cold brews that people have experienced come from this sort of experimentation early on in cold brews popularity. So brewing coffee with cold water was really made popular uh, in the United States by a company called the Toddy Company. The Toddy Company was selling a cold brewing device that was basically a plastic bucket with a nylon mesh filter, like a bag, and, uh, and a paper filter inside of that. And you'd see some variations on that, some that were just with paper, some that were just with the nylon mesh. You'd see some with this felt disc, this kind of compressed felt disc, you know, felt like the, the cloth. And you would keep this disc in the refrigerator soaked in water and all these all these different processes. Um, but the Toddy company made it very popular. And one of the selling points that Toddy advertised was that cold brew was one third the acidity of hot coffee and therefore more gentle on your stomach. Now, I haven't seen this confirmed with, you know, uh, official study and with, you know, peer review, but I have seen an informal study done by someone who worked as the head of a cold brew department of a fairly large coffee chain who did his own experiments with all the tools that he had at his disposal in the last five to 10 years. He did pH readings on a bunch of his, uh, his cold brew and hot coffee that was around in the cafes that he was working for. And the largest percentage difference he found between any of his cold brews and any of the hot brews was less than 1.5%. So it's kind of a misnomer that it's not as harsh on your stomach. It's just colder. So maybe you're not like sensing that bitterness right off the top. Yeah. And maybe that, that 1.5 makes a difference. Maybe it's psychosomatic. You know, like I said, this is not a peer reviewed official study. But there's at least some data to suggest that this one-third the acidity marketing term that the Toddy company used was a marketing thing instead of real hard science. What about flavor, though? I mean, are the flavors still as, as specific as they would be in a hot coffee? Are they watered down? I mean, which seems like an odd thing, but I guess just sitting in the water longer, are they... I, I've heard from other from coffee roasters that sometimes they think a packaged cold brew is a more accurate uh, representation of their coffee because nothing changes once it's packaged in, say, a can or something like that. And they, they're not worried about their customer brewing it, you know, and, and impacting the flavor of the coffee. But does that seem legit to you or is that something that you've, you've looked into or, or know anything about is as how the cold brew impacts the flavor? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean... Cold brew, when it's packaged in cans and bottles, is usually brewed with a fair amount of apparatus and infrastructure that is not readily available to your average home cold brewer. It's beyond this toddy maker bucket system. Uh, it, essentially, it still is a bucket system, but one of the problems with toddy or with cold brew in general is that it's really hard to filter all the grounds out. 
when you have hot water and a paper filter, because of the, the way the heat acts upon the filter and the, the hot water and the grounds act upon the filter, all the water tends to flow through this paper filter. But if you have cold water and the same coffee grounds, the grounds, the ultrafine particles tend to clog up the holes in the paper filter and sort of lock up the water from draining down. So you can't really gravity filter things the way that we normally do. We normally let gravity pull the water through the coffee grounds and pull it down. And then if you try to do a different method instead of gravity, you're going to tear the paper uh, because paper is only so strong and it's, it's wet paper. It's not that strong. So most of the time when we've got a really nice canned cold brew, it's been forced through a fairly thick filter, something like felt, like we talked about before, a fairly thick filter, and it's, it's pumped through using some pressure. And it's going to be kind of similar to like a, like a lot of the time they use beer pumps and filters to really make sure that none of that ultrafine sediment gets in the final product. And that ultrafine sediment, in addition to clogging up your filters, if it does get in the final product, if it fa- falls through those holes in the filter, if you're using a metal filter or just the nylon mesh bag, something that's not as intensive filtration as the felt plugs or a, a good paper filter, if you're using anything that's less than that, you're going to get too much ultrafine particles and fine particles that end up floating in your cup or can of cold brew. And those particles are going to continue to extract and they're going to extract undesirable compounds. They're going to extract things that are in the coffee bean that you don't want to taste. That's why if you leave your French press sitting and you forget about it while you're watching your episode of the morning news or whatever, um, and you leave it sitting for 15 minutes and then you plunge it and you pour your cup, it tastes so much worse than if you were paying attention and steeped it for the four to six minutes that you wanted to steep it for. So it's important to filter that stuff out and that stuff can have a really bad effect on the flavor of your coffee. And so those canned cold brews are really dialed in to to really eliminate all those factors that can cause a bad flavor in the coffee. Now, all that being said, there's still not that many cold brews I really love. And the reason for that is I like to break coffee brewing down to this, you know, sort of simple science of extraction. I try to break it down into ways that are easy for me to understand and easy for me to communicate. So I talk a lot about extraction of different flavor compounds that we like and don't like. So the main compounds we talk about extracting are acids, salts, caffeine, and sugars. So inside your coffee bean, inside your coffee grounds, you've got 800 different compounds that the human palate can detect. You've got all these different organic acids that make fruit flavors. You've got malic acid, the taste of apples and peaches. You've got citric acid, the taste of citrus fruit. You know, you've got uh, you've got some salts that sort of act as flavor enhancers and sort of balance out other flavors. You've got caffeine, which is something that we love when we're sleepy in the morning, but has a, a bitter taste to it. And then you do have a small amount of naturally occurring sugars. And a lot of those flavors, acids are usually sour. But if you pair them with sugars, they taste juicy. Salts can taste salty or metallic. But when you pair them with sugars, you get sort of like a salted caramel type effect, and it tastes extra sweet. Um, And when you pair bitter with sweet, you get bittersweet, which makes everything a little bit uh, easier to, to, a little bit more palatable. That's the basic way that I like to break down coffee extraction um, when I'm teaching about it and how the different things that we do when we're brewing coffee affect the taste of the ultimate. So now that I've said that, think about two of those compounds. Think about salts and think about sugars because acids, salts, and caffeine are all very soluble. They all mix in water very easily like salt. So you take salt and you put it in a cup of hot water and the salt's dissolved. You take a teaspoon of sugar and you put it in a cup of hot water. Sugar dissolves pretty easily. You do the same thing with the salt in a cup and the sugar in a cup, and now you add room temperature water. Even if you leave those cups sitting for 24 or even 48 hours, the salt one is going to dissolve more than the sugar one. And so this is my problem with cold brew, is that ultimately, even if you're extracting a certain percentage of the flavor compounds out of the beans and into your cold brew, into your liquid beverage, even if you're extracting the right percentage, we say that 
18 to 22% is the ideal extraction percentage. That means if you've extracted, if you've taken 18% of your coffee grounds and you've dissolved them into the water of the beverage that you're serving, that you've probably got a good balance of sugars, caffeine, salt, and acids. That's what that means. And then if you go more than 22%, if you take more than 22% of those coffee grounds and put them in your beverage, then you're going to be getting things that you don't like to taste in there. Phenols, chlorogenic acids, things that just don't taste good. There's no sugars that are going to balance out your phenols or chlorogenic acids that are going to make them taste good. It's just they're just going to taste bad. They're going to taste things like rubber or Band-Aid. There's like all kinds of bad ways the coffee can taste. And you might have experienced them when you left that French press sitting around. Well, cold brew, even if it gets to that 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 or 22 percent, even if it gets to the right ideal percentage of extraction, it's so hard to get those sugars in there. The chances are, if you're measuring it at 18, 19, 20, blah, 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 chances are if you're measuring it and you say, okay, this is a good extraction because I measured it, you've probably extracted some of those undesirable compounds and not quite enough of those sugars. It's just so hard to get sugars to dissolve easily in unagitated room temperature or colder water that you're never, to me, going to get the ideal flavor balance out of the coffee. Now, this is a long scientific rant. I've just been going on about different flavor <laughs> compounds, and I'm sorry if it was a little too esoteric there for a minute. I wasn't glazing over at all. Don't worry about it. I heard you snoring. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that all that being said, I have had cold brews that I've enjoyed. I did find some of my earliest coffee passion in cold brew. And it doesn't mean that you can't find a pretty good cold brew. It doesn't mean that some of those cold brews that I've had weren't good because some of that sugar will dissolve and you can get a pretty good balance of flavors. And the fact is, is that when brewing coffee, however much science we're putting in it, we're still working in the real world with real things and everything is imperfect. When we grind coffee, we're not grinding it to a perfect uniform, even particle size no matter how many dollars you spent on that fancy burr grinder. It doesn't matter. You're never going to get it totally, totally perfect. So you have to accept those compromises already when you're brewing hot coffee, when you're brewing espresso, when you're doing pour-overs, French press. We're always accepting those compromises. So it is possible to get a good cold brew batch where you've gotten a sufficient balance of sugars to make those other compounds taste good without extracting too many undesirable compounds. The easiest way to do it is to do it with a coffee that has the sugars more easily soluble. There is known coffees that are tend to be more soluble, where the, all, the, all the good stuff gets in there pretty easily. Uh, most coffees from Brazil are like that. A lot of coffee from Sumatra is like that. And sometimes you can roast your coffee a little bit darker to sort of get that same effect or a similar effect where you've kind of broken down some of those undesirable compounds with the extension of your roast time, and you've caramelized some of those sugars to make them a little bit easier to extract. So cold brew, not my favorite, but it is possible to get a pretty decent one. And the canned ones tend to have the biggest infrastructure behind them that gives them the best chance of being good. It reminds me a little bit of something you said right away in season one that I think we need to take with us through all of these conversations, which is the best coffee for you is the one that's getting you excited about coffee. Yes. And taking you to that next level, which is something you just said, you know, you started with cold brew and you've moved on to all these other things, but maybe if it wasn't for that experience with cold brew, you wouldn't have been so jazzed up that day to do something else. Totally. And jazzed up, not just excited, but also like caffeinated. <laughs> Wordplay. I, I, I saw that. I saw that. I know at Coffee Cycle, you don't necessarily serve a cold brew, but you do kind of a flash chilled coffee, right? which is not, not the same as leaving it sit overnight or anything like that. But it's, a, it's just a, it gives the illusion of a cold brew to somebody who's really wanting that cold brew, but in a much, I don't want to say a better quality, but just in a, in a more craft appropriate way. Yeah. I mean, it lets us avoid some of the, the pitfalls uh, that I've highlighted about cold brew while providing, you know, a really good product. Basically, we're brewing a hot coffee, extra concentrated, and brewing it directly over ice in a way that melts the exact right amount of ice to bring the dilution of the beverage back to the proper dilution so that it is that 
18 to 22 percent extraction it tastes good with like a 1.4 percent total dissolved solids it tastes strong it doesn't taste watery it doesn't taste extra strong uh, it tastes just right it's a little labor intensive but it, it tastes good <laughs> And more important than all that science stuff you just said is it looks cool when it drops from like the little container down into the glass of ice. It does look cool. It does look very cool. You got to do it in glass and clear and it just, it, it, it looks cool. I've always wanted to look cool. If you're not into coffee to look cool, then what are you even doing in this space? Honestly, <laughs> I really, I really don't know. Chris, I feel like I got smarter and then dumber and then smarter again in that explanation of cold brew. So I, I really appreciate you being here again. And we're, we're already like leaning into the second half of, of the Roast West Coast season two. So I'm really excited to get you back here in a couple of weeks to talk about um, different types of coffee and about coffee farming and all these other things that we've kind of been talking about getting on the schedule. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks a lot, buddy. Oh, it's always so good to see you. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy that part where you had to look at your dictionary. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> That's not a dictionary. It's just like uh, little tic-tac-toe games I've been playing with myself while you're talking over there. Aww. <laughs> Aww. Have I told all of you about the Voice of San Diego podcast yet? If you are into politics, specifically San Diego regional politics, then there's another show you should check out. It's called Voice of San Diego, and it is a weekly news podcast for local politics nerds. Every Friday, the editors at Voice of San Diego break down the biggest stuff that happened that week, and then they give their take on what it all means. You can check it out now wherever you listen to this show. Again, it's Voice of San Diego. Now back to some Coffee Smarter. I actually do feel a bit Coffee Smarter after the show today. Chris has a depth of coffee knowledge that always amazes me. He doesn't like cold brew, yet he just gave us a 20-minute, in-depth, TED Talk-style education on it. Amazing. Today's coffee vocab phrases are, as always, inspired by the show. And it is really to help myself clarify the differences between cold brew, iced, and flash-chilled coffees. Cold brew is just coffee brewed with cold water over a very long period of time generally 24 to 48 hours. Nearly the same, iced coffee is a hot drip coffee that is then combined with ice to make it cold. And finally, Japanese style or flash chilled coffee is a brewed pour over cup of coffee that is then quickly drained over ice. I think I got it. I will be back next week with an interview with Jason Simpson. He is the owner and proprietor of Camp Coffee in downtown Oceanside. Camp Coffee has quickly established itself as a hub in the downtown community and a place that stands for inclusivity, acceptance, and also great service. Jason and I talk about how he created the vibe there, where camp originated, and how his business has navigated both the coronavirus and some of the politics of the past year. If you just realized you're low on coffee, pick up a bag or five from one of the roast industry partners including Morea Coffee, Leap Coffee, Zumbar Coffee and Tea, Steady State Roasting, Cafe La Terre, Coffee Cycle, and Moster Coffee. And if you're listening to this show during happy hour, look for the First Light Coffee Whiskey, which will be a great addition to your home bar. And finally, thanks to Joe at Cape Horn Coffee Brokers for that fun coffee gift pack he sent this week. You'll find links to all friends of the show, right on the front of RoastWestCoast.com. Thank you all for listening to the show today. If you've enjoyed it, I'd appreciate it if you would tell a friend. That is the best way to help me grow this show. That, and maybe give it a share, a follow, or a shout on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, at RoastWestCoast. And, of course, sign up for that newsletter. It's on RoastWestCoast.com, and newsletters come out every Tuesday and Friday during the season. This episode of the Roast West Coast podcast was written, produced, and recorded by me, Ryan Wolt. I hope this show has found you happy, healthy, and with at least enough sanity to make it through another day. And please, always be sure to drink good coffee.
Hey everyone, this is Cody from San Diego's first and longest running local beer podcast, Beer Night in San Diego. If you love the local beer community, check out Beer Night in San Diego, available everywhere podcasts are found. Each and every week we bring you great local beer discussion, beer education, news, and tons more with a touch of comedy. Check out Beer Night in San Diego to laugh and learn with us.